people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India has been consistently sending humanitarian relief to Ukraine's border countries of Romania, Hungary and Poland in order to assist them in dealing with the refugee influx created by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. This is being done alongside India's massive evacuation endeavor, Operation Ganga, to bring back its stranded citizens, especially the students who could not leave the country amidst the rain of bullets and missiles. Hundreds of them have been safely brought back and the government says it is committed to bring back all its citizens in the coming days. It's been 10 days since Russia launched a fierce military offensive against Ukraine. And while it is cruising through the territory of the European nation, it is the civilians who have become most vulnerable to the indiscriminate firing and shelling. The government of India came into action as soon as its citizens, primarily the medical students who have been studying in the country, were stranded in the middle of nowhere. Operation Ganga was launched with the aim to bring back all students. Indian Air Force's largest transport aircrafts C-17 Globemaster were deployed. Four top ministers for four border countries of Ukraine were dispatched to facilitate the mission. Not just this, New Delhi also sent humanitarian assistance to Romania and Hungary in the form of tents and blankets to help them deal with the refugee influx. The aircrafts were loaded with about 2,500 blankets and over 100 rich tans for temporary relief. Advisories were released in time asking students to move to border areas from where they could be picked and airlifted back home. The advisory that has just been issued by our embassy a little while ago and also by us uh, on the need for our nationals to leave Kharkiv immediately is on the basis of information received from Russia. Prime Minister Narendra Modi along with top ministers has been reviewing all developments personally. Modi also spoke with both the presidents of Russia and Ukraine about providing a safe corridor for civilians to move out. In what has been lauded by many experts across the spectrum, the war unofficially halted for several hours after the Indian government negotiated with the Russian side in order to provide safe passage to Indians stranded in the largely occupied Kharkiv. Modi stated during a rally that he was committed to bringing back every single citizen of India. ये भारत का बढ़ता सामर्थ्य ही है कि हम यूक्रेन में फंसे हमारे देश के नागरिकों को वहां से सुरक्षित निकालने के लिए इतना बड़ा अभियान चला रहे हैं ऑपरेशन गंगा के तहत कई हजार नागरिकों को वहां से देश वापस लाया जा चुका है and while the aircrafts continue to shuttle the government with its embassies in all countries has been ensuring a safe stay of students who have crossed over but are waiting for their return Students were seen heaping praise on the government for the arrangements done at the border. The conditions were very bad. Then there were online colleges. 
तो तब तक तो एयर भी एयर फ्लाइट्स वगैरह बंद हो चुके थे तो निकलना पॉसिबल ही नहीं था तो इसीलिए बहुत मुश्किल हुई हमें और बॉर्डर के बाद बॉर्डर के पार तो कंडीशंस अच्छी है ट्रीट अच्छा किया जा रहा है लेकिन जब तक बॉर्डर क्रॉस नहीं कर रहे हैं तब तक हालात बहुत खराब है Around 20,000 Indian students study in Ukraine, mostly for medical studies. Most of them wanted to return last month after the government of India had issued an advisory asking them to leave temporarily. Many returned, but most of them were forced to stay as the universities weren't allowing any online classes for them. However, the government has decided to bring them back safely. It has stepped up its efforts in the last few days and says it will stop only when each student is back with his family. Moving on. The island nation of Sri Lanka is going through one of its toughest times in the country's recent history. We showed you last week how the forex crisis has severely impacted its economy and now it stares at another major challenge in the form of food price inflation thanks to the fertilizer ban the government had imposed in a bid to promote healthier agriculture although the decision was reversed in light of protests and demands that has simply not proven enough to undo the damages caused due to ripple effects of the decision Sri Lankan farmers are worried they know they are not going to yield the kind of produce they have been harvesting for years the government's overnight call of going organic dampened the sri lankan agriculture so hard that they could never recover farmers like wm seneviratne who used to harvest around 30 to 35 paddy bags per acre have had their return come down to 15 bags The dramatic fall in the yields is the result of a decision last April by President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to ban the use and importation of all chemical fertilizers in Sri Lanka as part of efforts to promote healthier agricultural practices and make farming more sustainable. Although the government rowed back on the move later, removing the ban after months of mass protests by farmers and a surge in food price inflation, The economic situation of farmers is just not seem to be improving as of now. Aurudagara vatak mo yi vaga vakarane. Natta elulta makarane. Tenen aurudula aurudak mo tiya ganna yakkara dekin akkara ke wi kyamata. Da me aurude ema tattayakat na karaganta basin kuliyai කුමුරට වියදම් කරපුවයි ගෙවන්න ගත්තම ඡාන අපහත දායකට පත් වෙලා තියෙනවා. ඒ හින්දා දැන් බොහොම අමාරු ජීවත් වීමක්. මේක වීග හිතන විතරක් නෙවෙයි එළොළු වගාවත් කරනවා. දැන් ඒක කරගන්නත් තත්යක් නැහැ මේ පොහොර නැති හිඳා. Despite the ban reversal only a trickle of chemical fertilizers made it to farms which will likely lead to an annual drop of at least 30% in paddy yields nationwide according to agricultural experts The shortfall comes at bad time for the island nation of 22 million people It is in the throes of its worst economic crisis in a decade foreign exchange reserves are at a record low and inflation is soaring especially for food Fuel shortages have also led to rolling power cuts across the country. The impact of poor paddy crop could push up the retail price of rice by around 30 percent. Me kaabeli ka vagavat tikka ki na me andwe vagavat ghihilla. Then me asanu nela na sielu govi angi na sevila sa apy bingol te ghiham tiye na tatte tamai. Venada akkar ekim bimiti tiha tispaag gatte bima. දැන් මේ පාර වීමිටි 15කට දක්වාම වර්ෂා පෝෂිත බැහැලා තියෙනවා සුළුවාරි මාර්ගත් ඒ හා සමානම 40ක් ගත්තා 45ක් ගත්තා නම් ඒක 20 දක්වා ඇවිල්ලා තියෙනවා to ease the hit on consumers rajpaksa's administration is importing rice using credit lines from friendly neighbors and to help farmers it has raised the minimum government purchase price and announced a 200 million dollar compensation package 
translating to a minimum of $248 per hectare as compensation. But what has happened right now is that the overall cost, uh, consumer price, I think, has gone up by about 20 to 22 percent, depending on uh, the food time. And that's not going to help the average consumer. Some farmers say the amounts are not enough and the government has become deeply unpopular according to a new survey by Colombo Think Tank Verite Research. Being ruled by Rajpaksa, Sri Lanka has gone through one of the most turbulent times in recent days economically. The agriculture crisis is expected to induce an unprecedented inflation which many believe will further deepen the crisis of the island nation. Moving on, as universities reopened their gates more than six months after the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan, the students have given contrasting feedback regarding the manner in which they are being operated. While some have expressed elation that they have managed to continue their studies, others have been deeply critical of the radical changes in the curriculum and university atmosphere and have called it a madarsa syllabus and not the one that would principally focus on science, arts and philosophy. Shukriya Hujjat is one of those tens of thousands of girls who were waiting in uncertainty about the reopening of the universities in war-torn Afghanistan. The Taliban that captured power in August last year had imposed sweeping sanctions on the society and it was the women who bore the major brunt. And now, despite the decision of reopening, the students do not feel that it is the same university they were studying in last year during the West-backed Ghani regime. The University of Kabul has gone through some radical changes, both at curriculum and atmosphere aspects where the students say they are being subject to restrictions and syllabi they had never expected. Hujjad feels the university has become more of a madarsa than a progressive public academic institution. The expansion of women's rights, particularly in urban areas, was held up as one of the main achievements of Western military and financial intervention in Afghanistan after the US-led war that toppled the last Taliban government in 2001. Until then, in addition to the education ban, almost all jobs were off-limits to women and they could only leave home when accompanied by a male relative and wearing an all-enveloping burqa. Female enrollment was around 24% of the total signed up at public universities in 2020, according to figures from the World Bank-funded Higher Education Development Program roughly 21,000 women. Significant investment in girls' schools and targeted measures at universities such as reserving seats for women in law and engineering, female dormitories and childcare centres saw thousands of women pursue degrees. But now, with the Taliban return, their lives have come to square one, with similar restrictions back in place. However, there are still a few optimists who have expressed relief over the reopening of universities for they believe it is better to have some education than no education. The Taliban government has been asking the world over to recognize it and make it a part of the global mainstream. 
However, the major concerns expressed by almost everybody has been around women's rights, which they say haven't seen any significant improvement even after over six months of the Taliban return. There have also been cases where the women have fallen victim to the reprisal attacks carried out by Taliban. And now, with higher education too facing a religious crackdown by the Taliban, the future of the gender looks bleak and the observers worry if the Taliban get what it has been asking, then the graph might drop down even more. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Hundreds of demonstrators recently turned out outside Israel's parliament, the Neset, in Jerusalem to call on Israel to help Ukraine against the Russian invasion of its territory. The protesters, some of the Ukrainian origin, called on Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett to take action and help Ukraine militarily. Talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials began on the Belarusian border last week as Russia faced deepening economic isolation after invading Ukraine in the biggest assault on a European state since World War II. However, the sanctions haven't been able to deter Russia so far as it has only intensified its attacks since then and has captured large territories of Ukraine. The United Nations Security Council imposed an arms embargo on Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthis after the group claimed several drone and missile assaults on the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia this year. The measure, proposed by the UAE, expands a targeted UN arms embargo on several Houthi leaders to the whole group. It received 11 votes in favour, while the remaining four council members, Ireland, Mexico, Brazil and Norway, abstained. The UAE mission to the United Nations said the resolution would curtail the Houthis' military capabilities and put an end to the suffering of civilians in Yemen and in the region in the face of these terrorist attacks. A Saudi-led coalition has been battling the Houthis for seven years in a conflict largely seen as a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. The war has killed tens of thousands of people and caused a dire humanitarian crisis. This is the entrance to the business space Open Hub for Smart World opened by Entity Communications in Tokyo. Entity has the latest technology in the office. It's a meeting room with the image of water and nature. The windows are equipped with 5G antennas. Communication cable-inspired copper tables are designed from old wood and copper. It is a sustainable point of SDG's view. Visitors can participate remotely from faraway places. Entity Communications has developed many technologies to connect people. Entity's open hub where technologies from various fields communicate will be a place to solve many of the world's challenges in the near future. Washoku is a traditional Japanese cooking competition which has been attracting chefs from all over the world for the different delicacies, cooking methods, ingredients and beautiful presentations. An international competition, Washoku World Challenge was organized by an online platform this time. Six finalists from the USA, United Kingdom and Brazil were nominated for cooking creative Washoku dishes. They got the opportunity to learn authentic Washoku cooking from Japanese chefs. This lecture was delivered on YouTube. Lee's finalist dish is fish soup. At first, Mr. Nonaga reviews her cooking work. She used ingredients that were difficult to get in Korea. Wow, 
、お客様に喜んでもらうっていうのを提供するのが僕らの、えーね、おもてなしですね、本当に。という気持ちで、えー、料理、日本料理はすごくそういうのを意識してますね。The continuous effort of Japanese authorities to popularize Washoku contributes to expanding Japanese cuisine all around the world. Moving on, India and Nepal recently got soaked in the festivities of one of the most auspicious o c c a s i o n of Hindus, Mahashivratri. Dedicated to Lord Shiva, the festival is observed with great pomp and show across the countries, with most of the people spending the day in praying and fasting. Shiva temples decked up in colorful lights with devotees crowding around them to offer milk, flowers, and leaves to shivlings marks the auspicious occasion of Mahashivratri. Observed on a new moon day in the month of Mark of the Hindu calendar, the festival is celebrated in the honor of Hindu god Shiva and marks a remembrance of overcoming darkness and ignorance in life and the world. Devotees also observe a full day fast on Mahashivratri, which is kept not only to attain Shiva's blessings but is also a test of one's own determination. In India, 12 Shivratris are observed in a year, out of which Mahashivratri is considered the most auspicious. According to legends, on this night, Lord Shiva performs a cosmic dance of creation, preservation, and destruction, also known as Tantav. This year, devotees were happy to perform prayers at the temple itself, as for the last two years, they were not allowed to do so due to the COVID 19 pandemic. Last two years, we have been here because of COVID. We have been here for this year. 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 As part of Mahashivratri occasion, an annual chariot procession was taken out in Rameswaram town of India's southern state of Tamil Nadu. As the festival is also considered to be the marriage anniversary of Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati, the procession is very much the enactment of Shiva's wedding. In Rameswaram, Mahashivratri continues for 12 days and is thronged by people from other states as well. Much enthusiasm is also witnessed in other parts of the country since morning, hordes of devotees fill up the premises of various temples. कि भोले जी की कृपा है कि अब जो भी यहाँ चल रहा है जो कोरोना वगैरह चल रहा था वो सब ठीक हो बस हम भी दर्शन करने आए हैं फेस्टिव फीवर वॉज ऑन अनादर लेवल इन नेपाल्स कैपिटल काठमांडू वेर द सेक्रेट टेम्पल ऑफ पशुपति नाथ वॉज ब्रीमिंग विद साधुस एज ए रिटर्न आफ्टर द कोविड नाइन्टीन पैंडमिक Every year on Mahashivratri, this temple, which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, gets flooded with sadhus from Nepal, India, and other parts of the world. Mahashivratri is also mentioned in several Purans, particularly the Skanda Puran, Linga Puran, and Padma Puran. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.